Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the very, very last lecture uh, in the course. I, I thought a lot about how to conduct this lecture today. So should I go through an extensive summary of the whole course, each lecture? Uh, or should I just open the floor for questions? Should we go through the quizzes in details and, and things like this? Uh, so here's what I, come up, uh, what I came up with. I will give you a very short summary. It's about, it's actually four slides of the basic ideas in the course. Uh, and then we, we immediately start with questions. I think that's the best thing for, for most of you, for the majority of, of, of the people. Those of you who are interested in more details about some of the topics, uh, of course we can discuss this also privately after the, co uh, after the lecture. Uh, but I thought that the majority of you would like to have questions answered. Am I correct, more or less? Yes, so one person agrees with me. Um, I, I thought that's the best thing for the exam, because um, it's important f yeah, with this new Bologna system and, and so on and so forth, it's important not to kind of over-engineer in a sense, for the exam, all right, o overstudy. Those of you who are interested in just getting a good grade would embrace this concept. Those of you who want to go into more depth, we can also do that. But I think the majority of you just want to, you know, uh, get a good grade. All right, so that's what we're going to do. M about 10 minutes I'm going to I'm going to spend on, on the summary. Then we go through the quizzes, not every question, but at least the problematic questions. Um, and then we start with the, with the Q&A session. One thing to say, I think the deadline for the third online quiz was yesterday midnight, right? So I will process the results right after the lecture. And the people who would not get the test out, you would get an email from me notifying you that you didn't get the test out, so you can't come to the exam. Uh, but if you, I think you know best whether you've passed two out of three online tests. So you don't need to wait for my email to know that you didn't get the test out. Um, uh, about the exam, <laughs> ironically, I'm still not perfectly sure where it's going to take place, which room. This is, I think, too small for all people. And there are regulations regarding the minimum distance between people and so on. So basically, I will check this today and I'll send everyone an email <coughs> with the exact location of the exam next week. All right. <coughs> are there any questions before we start? Something unrelated to the course? Yes? You mean the the website of the chair? Yes. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, I didn't update it. The exam is on Thursday, of course. It's the last lecture. It cannot be on any other day because we just we didn't have. I mean, we don't have the time slot. And I think for most courses, the exam is in the last lecture, right? Or no? Okay, by the way, uh, how much time, I, I already forgot, how much time is normally given to an MTech exam? 90 minutes or two hours? Really? Hmm, all right. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get a second opinion on that. <coughs> because, hmm, okay. Anyway, so let's, let's start. I will kind of repeat myself, but I will repeat what I think are the more important concepts of the course. Um, the larger part of the course was spent on <coughs> this notion of controlling solutions. So nonlinear dynamics, systems dynamics, and it especially at the end when we looked at business cycles, we got kind of, I feel we got too much into detail uh, with equations, with technicalities. Right, like, uh, what kind of bifurcation is this? Uh, what is the 
Jacobian of that system, what is the determinant of that system. Um, and I feel that some of you may have lost the bigger picture, as I mentioned uh, on Tuesday, actually, at the, at the self-study. All these three parts that we looked at, I including the last one, are related to each other. So the last part, controlling solutions, it does not exist on its own. It doesn't come first, actually. What comes first, as we saw, is, uh, first of all, trying to understand what we're actually doing. Okay, before putting down an equation, we first try to, we have to understand what we're doing, what problem we're solving. And we looked into the reasons why the most problems in life are not simple, or the interesting problems that we try to solve are not simple. And I gave you three reasons for this, I think. Yes, three reasons. First of all, most interesting real-life problems are just difficult to define in natural language. You can think about defining a problem in natural language. You have a complex situation like the Chiri Airport. This is the um, standard example. So how do you define the problem in a natural language? If you ask the different stakeholders, they're all going to tell you a different thing. Right? So this is the notion of ill-defined problems. We just cannot define them, let alone come up with an algorithm to solve them. And one reason why we cannot define them is because they have multiple optimization criteria. They have many different viewpoints um, and, and kind of preferences. And that's why we cannot define them. This is the, yes, contradicting but correlated optimization criteria. Right? So there are lots of times criteria are contradicting with each other. This is the worst situation. Um, <coughs> for these problems, as you can guess, multiple perspectives generate multiple solution possibilities. So I may prefer, uh, as, as an airline, I may prefer another runway at the Cherry Airport. You, as a, as a citizen, you may prefer a different airport far away from your house. Right? So different solution criteria exist exactly because we have multiple preferences. All these, I mean, this is kind of a heuristic explanation why problems are not simple, but all of these three things um, are, in a sense, the source of complexity or the source of diversity that we uh, looked further in the course. So multiple solutions, multiple optimization criteria. Um, you can say difference in people, because this is all coming from difference in people. It generates diversity in life. And I hope I managed to communicate the notion that this is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Diversity is good because, um, is it mentioned here? No, it's not mentioned. <coughs> well, diversity is a good thing because it allows systems to adapt and to evolve. If you have a system um, which is static, and, and this goes to the notion of, um, oh no, it's on the next slide. Well, if you have a system which doesn't change, if everybody likes the same thing, have the same preferences, that system would be static, it will not change anymore. We, have, we won't have any progress. So diversity is good, and um <coughs> related to diversity is, is then the notion of complexity, or complex problems. Um, we looked at complexity not as, as something confusing, uh, but as a system's property. Just like, uh, just, just as systems have size, color, um, stability, instability, they also have this additional property that we introduced, and that is complexity. We don't want to remove the complexity. We don't want to explain it away. We just want to understand it, and to understand how to, uh, how to control it, in a sense. And um, <coughs> we, we had a look at two major sources of complexity. I mean, complexity is not magic. The fact that you get, let's say in the logistics map, you get uh, this huge sensitivity to initial conditions which eventually make the system unpredictable in the long term, this is not magic. The sources of diversity that we looked at were two. 
actually more, but we just in this course we, we dealt with two. This is the uh, feedback cycles. You know, w w when you have related activities and each of them feedback on, on a previous one, all these non-linearities non introduced by the feedback cycles generate complexity. Um, I mean, ab above all, they, ge they generate unintended consequences, right? And this is, in essence, complexity. So you, you do something, but you really have no idea what the consequences would be. And then we looked at all these measures that management takes. Hiring new people has unintended consequences of diluting the quality uh, of your workforce or making, more uh, ma making people work more has the unintended consequences of stress and overwork and so on and so forth. The second uh, source of complexity um <coughs> uh, were these non-linearities non which are inherent in the systems, uh, in the system dynamics, uh, or in the, in, the, in the system actually. So there we, we looked at bifurcations and the role of critical parameters, uh, but in essence, the source of complexity here was non-linearity. So the system responds in a non-linear way to an input. And because it's non-linear, you cannot predict it easily. If everything was linear, we wouldn't have any complexity, any chaos, nothing. It would have been very nice, very easy. So you see, it's not magic. This is not, well, it's com complex, it's complexity, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's God, I don't know. It's really nonlinear response to an input, which makes it um, hard to predict, and feedbacks. Things feedback to previous things, and you have no idea what's going on. And then one notion that, that I hope I, I managed to convey is that if you've done your best to analyze the problem, to implement the problem, uh, to implement the solution, before that, choosing the right solution. If you've done your best, and still you get chaotic behavior, you, you get complex behavior, in it, let's say we looked at the supply chain. If you still get that, it's not your fault as a manager. It's a system's property, right? Doesn't mean that now you, when, when you become managers, you need to be very lax about doing your job. It just means that sometimes there is nothing you can do. And you have to kind of learn how to deal with this and how to convey or how to communicate this to other people as well. Um, the fact that we have this chaotic behavior in most supply chain systems today, <coughs> despite all the effort that goes you know, from academics and from managers and from, from employees, simply attest to this, to this notion that complexity is, could be a system's property and we just cannot reduce it. Um, <coughs> so yeah, the problem solving cycle, um, yeah, I, I'm not gonna say anything about that. I think it's clear enough. Uh, what I want to spend some time on is what's in your notes. Um, so the sources of complexity, I think there was a slide in, in the lecture introducing complexity, were, yes, feedback cycles, non-linearities, non but also I think we had a bullet point saying something like uh, complexity can arise from the interactions among individual elements, from individual interactions. I believe there was a bullet point. We didn't look into that, right? We didn't look at interactions between elements. What we looked at were representative agents, basically, the systems dynamics approach. The interaction, the individual interactions, or so-called agent-based modeling, is topic of these two courses, which are going to be taught uh, next semester. They're elective courses, both of them, which means that the MTech department doesn't consider them to be um, basic requirement, in a sense, uh, to graduate. Uh, when I was doing the master's degree, uh, the collective dynamics of firms was a core course, and the economic networks course didn't exist, uh, which I'm very sad about because it's a great course. Um, the economic networks is introduces one major aspect that we completely ignored, and that is um, networks, obviously. 
Um, but you see, in any system, in any real system, economic system, financial system, social system, uh, people are not just uh, interacting with all the other people at random, but they're embedded in a network, right? So if you think, let's say, about the adoption model, the bus innovation model, what we looked at were just adopters and potential adopters. And an implicit assumption was that adopters communicate with all the potential adopters, right? Which is obviously not true. The results can change drastically if you introduce networks. And this is a very hot topic today. There are a lot of practical applications to this network approach, especially in, in finance, uh, where people study a lot how the different financial institutions are interlinked with each other and how this translates then to the stability of the whole system. Right? Because if you have a system which is highly interconnected, you may think this is a good thing for, let's say, flow of information, for adaptability. Uh, and it's true, but it's also true that this system is very, very susceptible to a just a few institutions failing. And then this failure propagates basically like a plague through the whole system. So the Economic Networks is a course which, which studies a lot of practical examples, which is a good thing for those of you who like it. A lot of practical examples of, um, <coughs> um, of, of real-life networks, not just abstract models. Collective dynamics of firms is agent-based modeling is the other source of complexity. All right, now let's move on. As I mentioned, controlling solutions, the system dynamics and stuff like this, is just the last part of, of a larger kind of framework. The first one was defining what the problem is, understanding the different preferences of different stakeholders, coming up with solutions, this is the problem solving cycle, coming up with solution approaches, and then choosing some of the better solutions. And remember, it's, it's, it's your job as decision makers to choose the right solution. There is no algorithm for this. The second step, after you've chosen the solution, you know what you should do, but you have no idea how to do it. It's the implementing of the solution. And here we looked at um, kind of two straightforward, or let's say standard uh, approaches to implement a solution. That's a, the project management, which is basically um, structuring your project, your, your, your hope, yeah, your project into different subtasks and trying to figure out how exactly to implement each subtask. In what sequence can you implement some things in parallel, um, <coughs> which is a good thing. Can you deal with uncertainty in, in your implementation? Remember the critical path? Uh, we use these buffers. And right now I can tell you that there w is going to be, for sure, one question regarding the critical path method on the exam. So those of you who write emails, I have no idea what's going to be on the exam. I'm totally confused. Um, you know, it's awful. One question is going to be critical path method. That's for sure. It's not going to be enough, though. One question, so yeah. All right. Um, <coughs> then we're implementing our solution. Um, and then we find out that some of some parts of this solution don't work. This is the quality control feedback loop that we introduced. So basically, the project management approach defines rigorous criteria how to evaluate your progress. We had this um, gateway. No, gateways was it? It was gateways, right? Was it gateways? The checkpoints? <coughs> milestones, milestones, yes. Thank you. Gateway, I, I'm thinking about something else. That's why I said gateway. All right. Uh, milestones, yes. So we check the progress at each milestone. Something doesn't work. We go into this problem solving cycle notion again, going back and redoing things. This is the quality control. And the quality control. The major message is that it's just another feedback loop. 
something else. Okay. Finally, the last part was controlling of the solution. So you've done your best to choose some of the better solutions. You've done your best to implement it on time with the desired quality, within the desired time frame. And then you see that your solution basically doesn't work as you expected. So there is kind of a, let's say, chaotic behavior. And this was the last part of the course, understanding whether it was actually your fault or whether it's a system's property. And of course, we took a kind of a biased perspective. We only looked at systems where it was not your fault. But there are l much, uh, many more examples in real life where it's, gonna it's going to be your fault. So, <coughs> yeah. Um <coughs> as I mentioned, the source of complexity were the feedback cycles and the critical parameters, so the bifurcations. Um, an important thing here, and, and I kind of started this discussion on Tuesday, the business cycle. So are they good or are they bad? Right? Um, we looked at instability or systems which are unstable meaning that when you vary a critical parameter, you suddenly change the system behavior. We looked at this instability, but we didn't actually come to a conclusion, is that a good thing or is that a, a bad thing? Uh, some of you think that this is a bad thing because it leads to a destruction of wealth and unemployment and stuff like that. Some of you think it's a good thing because it leads to progress. Instability, actually, if you think about it, it, it doesn't... It the notion of instability means basically a system which is able to change, right? This is what instability means. A system which is susceptible to change. And that's a good thing. If you think about instability in this way, so a system which is able to change, then it's a good thing. Because that's how, um, uh, how, the, how systems evolved. If a system is static, impossible to, to change, uh, then it, it's locked, kind of. So the ability, if you look at instability as ability to change, it's a good thing. It's so it happens in real life that uh, the change is not only upwards, it also, it's also downwards. Um, but the notion of instability per se is a good thing. Uh, yes. We looked into um, chaos. I'm going to spend a few words on this when we go through the quiz. But, but for now, th think about chaos not as, um, not as random forces affecting your system, random forces that you cannot predict. Chaos, in particular deterministic chaos, is unpredictability that arises from the dynamics of your system, which dynamics could be perfectly deterministic, as we saw with the logistics map. So, another hint, there is going to be question about um, this notion of chaos on the exam. Okay, so make sure you, you, you understand what is meant by chaos. Yeah. I, I, I want to say yes. Um, you see, it's like chaos is like complex systems. People cannot agree on a common definition. What is complex systems? What is chaos? For us, chaos is not the result of random forces, but it's the result of completely deterministic dynamics and non-linearities. I mean, non-linearities in the dynamics, obviously. Um, some people may think that if we have random forces affecting your system, let's say random noise, some not white noise, but let's say some funny-looking noise, 
that could generate chaos as well because it's in essence unpredictable and it's it's a it's a correct notion but at least i i don't i i haven't come across a common definition of what chaos is so everybody understands it differently that's why i want to make it clear what we mean by chaos in this course yes and that yeah exactly um right let's see what i also have put here right so uh, uh, the last four lectures i think were about cycles and oscillations and what we saw there is that one if, if you think about all the models that we saw we generate business cycles one commonality between all of them is time delays time delays generate oscillations right we looked at time delays with the inventory correction time i think um, and then we looked at time delays with um, consumer uh, suppliers anticipating or not anticipating but taking into consideration previous consumption so there was always time delay with generated oscillations or, or cycles um, yeah so if, if, if you have problems remembering uh, what all these models were about think about time delays because, I mean, why? It's not magic. Why do time delays generate cycles? Well, simply because with time delay, we have an associated response. And that response, in terms of overreaction or underreaction, is what generates the mismatch between what really happens and what you think should have happened. So if you overreact, uh, you basically you think that what should have happened is a lot, is a lot more than what actually happened, right? <coughs> okay. I I don't think have any I don't have anything more to say about this. I don't want to to waste time repeating myself. So, as I said, what I'm going to do now is to go through the quizzes really quick. You can ask me questions, or I mean, I don't know how sh uh, how I should do it. Do you want me to ask? Uh, do you want to ask me questions about particular quiz questions, or should I go through all the quizzes, through all the questions, and explain? the reasoning behind every answer. What should I do? Who wants to go through, who wants me to go through all the questions in all the quizzes? Well, I think it's less than the half. Not every single one, but it, yeah, okay, fine. Okay, okay. All right. So this is the first quiz. Can you can you read the the question in the back? All right. So why is it important to accept short-term deteriorations in solving a complex problem? It's a question. The 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 kind of the short answer is uh, because this. Uh, this is related to instability. This allows us to explore uh, outcomes that in the long term may turn out to be better. Right? We don't have unlimited, unlimited um, rationality or we don't have unlimited capability of exploring the future in a sense. So we accept short-term deteriorations in order to escape from this kind of suboptimal minimum, suboptimal solution. Milestone trend diagram, okay, well, this is just the slide. What is the difference between complex and trivial problems? 
<laughs> yeah. It's basically this. It's what I said, right? We have unclear solution space and, and multiple conflicting criteria and so on and so forth. Um, this is directed from the slides. What are two sources of complexity, right? Introduced in the lecture. So we had nonlinear feedbacks. That's one thing. This one we didn't actually study in the course. It's next semester, but we introduced it nevertheless. Um, <coughs> okay, this is again taken from the slides, the objectives. Okay, first order, second order solutions, I think it's clear. By the way, I, I, I found a really nice example of a second order solution. Um, yeah, anyway. It was, uh, you know, this, uh, how is this game called? Tic-tac-toe, right? You know the game? Oh, I have, I have to show it to you. It's, it's really <laughs> ingenious. We have plenty of time this lecture, so... Um, all right. So let's say we have the following situation. Tac. And... Uh, Okay, so let's say, well, we have this situation, oh no, uh, yeah, we have this situation, so if it's my turn, I can just do this. You know, it's kind of thinking outside of the box. Yeah. It looks much better when it's on a, on a picture. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I'm looking for a good diagram to illustrate this notion. We had the lines, but I don't like the lines so well. What is the right sequence of activities? That's just from the slides. Free flow, just from the slides. Ah, there was a... Yes, I think there was a confusion with this question. Let me try to remember what it was. Um, I think, uh, no, there, there was something with the free float. I think that def one of the wrong answers was actually correct if you think about free float in a more general sense. I forgot. If you remember, just ask me. Uncertainty. Oh, yes, 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 yes. The uncertainty. So with my idea was the following. With the critical path method, you, we had these buffers to incorporate um, kind of... Um, oh, we didn't have the buffers, but we, had we, we could calculate the free float and total float, so basically the times by which an activity could be delayed without affecting the whole project or without affecting the uh, activity immediately next in sequence. So the idea here was that we can incorporate a limited notion of uncertainty by just taking this kind of free time that we get and or taking the buffers and incorporating uncertainty by just varying the size of the buffers. So if you're not sure uh, how, how much time your task is going to take, you simply allocate more buffers to this task. But then, I, uh, yeah, so this was the idea. But then some people, and, and that's why the answer is um <coughs> this one, by using the floats. I think there was only one, one, one right answer here. Is that correct? Let's see. So now you see how the quizzes are created. Um, what was it? Critical path. This one. Was it this one? No. Critical path two. 
Yes. Critical path two. Minus this. Yes. There was only one correct answer. And this was my idea. To have uncertainty incorporated into the buffers, into the floats. But then some people thought, well, yes. Yes, um, the slight difference which I didn't mention in the in the lecture was that with the this last thing, what was it called? Pert. Yes, um, there you incorporate a certainty based more on an empirical evidence. So you come up with this formula, how to calculate the time based on optimistic, pessimistic, and, and whatever scenario, but it's kind of an empirical thing. So y based on experience, you define the weights for, for the different, for the different um, uh, cases. But with the, with the critical path method, you can still incorporate a limited notion of uncertainty, which is basically your intuition. You know, how, vari vari how variable your, your, your task is going to be. I understand it's a bit confusing. I have a memory of mentioning that floats can be used to incorporate uncertainty in the time required for the activity, but it's definitely not explicitly mentioned as a bullet point in the slides. Um, so yeah. But this was the reasoning here. <coughs> Defined objectives, blah, blah, blah. Free float, uncertainty. What was the main cause for small changes? Okay, I think that's that's also clear. Basically, feedback loops. What is a system? I think all of you know this already. Ah, okay, yes. Another uh, kind of a linguistic confusion was this. What is the first step? So by first step, I meant really the most, the uppermost bullet point in the problem solving cycle. Not the first step within the first step within the first step or something like this. Uh, so that also caused some confusion. Mm, okay, problem solving cycle. What? Oh. Uh, let me try to find the lecture slide for you. Which lecture is this? Was it two? Hmm. Yes. Yeah, it's lecture three then. No, it's lecture four. There was a slide about this. Oh, yeah. Okay. So if you refer to lecture four, slide nine, where control gates are explained, uh, there is a bullet point. So there, there is a... Uh, so what could happen at the control gate? Everything is fine. Quality standards are adhered to. Move on. Second, something is not fine. You need more resources. You need more time. Whatever. Um, out of this, 
multiple things can happen. First of all, you can get the required resources. You can e kind of extend the schedule if you want. But if you can't, then what happens is you kind of psychologically start thinking, well, um, maybe that solution that we rejected in the beginning was not that bad after all. It would take us less time, less resources. Yeah, it's, it's not uh, quantitatively the best, but we made these assumptions in evaluating it. Maybe our assumptions are not perfectly correct. Maybe it will turn out to be okay at the end. Right? And this is why the bullet point is already existing alternatives become more attractive, even if suboptimal. And I remember spending some time on, thinking on, on talking about this kind of psychological trap that, that you start rationalizing suboptimal solutions. So that's why. <coughs> All right. Uh, because this is not how we introduce project management by changing your uh, by changing your goals ex post. I mean that's like changing a master thesis topic in the last month. I understand that this is what can happen in real life for sure, but this is not how we introduce project management. No, the goal the goal is still the same. Build this factory or something. Yeah, but what, what this requires, what this factory. What this Good, let's move on. You know, it's always uh, the case when, when people try to factor in previous knowledge and previous experience, and everything could be challenged, basically. Every assumption, every statement could be challenged based on, on the different experiences that people have. Uh, and and that's that's a good thing in education. A bad thing in in education is that this doesn't uh, go so well on an exam. Uh, so I perfectly understand that uh, things can be challenged, and it's a good thing. But challenge them after the exam. Let let me put it this way. All right. What is the purpose of a project? I think it, there was a bullet point about this in the slides. Techniques, bullet point. Which of the following is not topping of the course? Uh, <laughs> okay, so. Uh, maybe I should slightly apologize for this question, although I don't find it too confusing. Um, the answer is none of the above. Okay. Uh, so basically everything else is a topic of the course, which means that what is not topic is none of the above. Yeah. So yeah, the point is that I, I, I chose that the, the answers should be shuffled within a question and then this got completely messed up. <laughs> but yes, if, you're te yeah, if, if you want to be technically correct, <laughs> none of the above refers to A. So <laughs> is not addressed in the course. Yes, so linear optimizations, we didn't look into that. For a positive, okay, fine. Uh, characteristic of total float. Or maybe the total float was the confusing one. Uh, I don't remember now. Online quiz two. Let's go. What is the role of inventory correction? There is a bullet point for this. What results do you expect? Yes. So I spent some time on giving a kind of a motivation or justification, not justification, but let's say yeah, motivation for, for why we do the models we do and what we expect from them. 
So do you want me to go through the quizzes in the break? It's not going to require too much participation on your side, so it's like you can still relax. All right. Mm. I hope I made it clear that we don't want this. We don't want this. So basically the, the, the answers are this and this. Understanding the minimum ingredients required to reproduce a given behavior. And I gave you this example with cooperation. All right. What is a fixed point? I think that's clear. Mechanism for driving comma source. This is public information. That's also clear. Oh, so thi thi this I came up with this question. Um, so the idea was the following. It was the relationship between... Cor uh Correlation, the difference between correlation and causality. And the notion is that, uh, the idea is that correlation does not imply causality. So, you, um, you go to bed with your shoes on and then you wake up with a headache. So what can we say about the situation? One thing we can certainly uh, can say for sure is that, oh, not for sure, but one thing that, um, we cannot say for sure is this, for instance. I don't know if it's medically proven, but I guess not. Now, this correlation, so what I presented in the statement is a correlation. Going to bed with shoes, waking up with a headache. This correlation may be due to an external factor, such as going to bed drunk and forgetting to take your shoes off, or you went you you were sober but you went to bed with a headache in the first place right so the statement just presented you with a correlation it did not present you with with the causal uh kind of position of these two events i did not say that first you put your shoes on and then you develop the headache right so you can also think well maybe we had the headache in the first place so these are the two correct answers uh, B and C may be correct too. They may be correct too. But they make the step, the jump from correlation to causality. B and C try to explain your headache uh, by the fact that you, you have shoes, which is this jump uh, that we want to avoid without enough evidence, of course. Which is not evidence of chaos. This is an evidence, sensitive to initial conditions. Nonlinearity, I mentioned it. This is an evidence. Now, this is not an evidence. Okay? For the chaos as introduced in this lecture, it's what we discussed before. Okay, structural perspective. There was a bullet point for this taking the system, modeling the elements. Stuff like that. This is again taken from the slides. This is again taken from the slides. What is the primary reason for developing the workforce model? Okay, that's a yeah. So, yeah. What would it be? What would it be easier for you? <laughs> for me, it's like if it's an equation like this, this, this size, it's okay. But if it's a bigger equation, then it's this size. Yeah, and it's too hard to easy to remember. So, an equation like this would be easy to remember. For me, yes. But I'm not sure for the others. Would okay. How easy would that be to remember? Yeah, really, come on. <laughs> okay, so we're not going to have these, e these equations. <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, you don't need to remember that, don't worry. Okay. No need. Okay. 
Yeah, I mean, a question could be, for instance, um, what are two, what are the two control parameters in in the Higgs model, for instance? And then you say it's the multiplier and it's the accelerator. Now, having said that, there won't be such a question, but there would be a question similar to that. Well, I mean, it's 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 logical. So, um, yeah. You don't, you don't need to remember the equations. Let me take this huge load off your chest. No need to remember equations. Although it would help you to reason, to answer questions like these. Uh, what was the primary reason? This was the primary reason. What, this is what we observed in the beginning. Okay? Uh, in the beginning, meaning we started off with this empirical fact and we tried to explain it. <sighs> okay. These are all things. So B, C, and D, they came kind of, they came out of the model once we've developed it. But why we developed it? Because of A. All right. Overcrowding, it's an S curve, that's, that's clear. Uh huh. So another hint for the exam. I mean, I might have it as well just handed you the exams now. I said so much already. Um, chaos, it's related to chaos. So what, what is the answer to this question? We have a system. We run that system with the same initial conditions, absolutely the same initial conditions. Uh, so let's say we've, we run it once. I think it's the logistics map. Yes. We run the logistics map, we calculate all the hundredth iterations, including the hundredth, hundredth iteration. Then we run it again, we start from the beginning with the same initial conditions. The question is, what was the exact question? Can we always predict the value for the hundredth iteration after we've already calculated it once, given the same initial conditions? And the answer is yes, we have it. The logistics map uh, is I the logistics map is not something. Uh, it doesn't have dynamics which which change given the same state variables. Okay, if x is something, x plus one is defined exactly what what what, I what it's going to be. The chaos comes from sensitivity to initial conditions. So if our initial conditions are slightly wrong, just by a fraction, you can think of this fraction as computing uh, kind of some kind of uh, storage problems in your, uh, in your computer, then the 100 iteration would be very far from what you computed before. But given the same initial conditions, and we have to be correct saying, uh, I don't know, absolutely correct, computer precision, unlimited computer precision when we calculate things, then it's completely predictable. Once you've calculated it, you can reuse this value. Hmm? The, the, the answer is this one. This is the great answer. So you're saying maybe predict is not the right word. Okay, I agree. It may be not the right word. Which is not the source of complexity. Definitely li linearity. Linearity does not produce complex behavior. Why? Well, it's simple. I mean, you provide an input, you know exactly what your output is going to be. It's kind of a fraction of your input. Bifurcations, I think you already know this. Okay, I think I canceled this question at the end. So I gave everybody one point. I don't, I don't know if it makes sense to go through this question, but it, it, yeah, it's, it's a bad question on my side. What I meant here is um, 
so we have this isolated policies and integrated policies. Isolated policies are basically kind of do one thing, let's say, reduce inventory correction time. You know, that's that's a policy. Another policy may be improve customer service. Then an integrated policy could be do both at the same time. Now my thinking here was that uh, a policy, a single policy, integrated policy, um, isolated policy is controlled by just one control parameter, which is not necessarily true. You can have a policy being influenced by multiple control parameters, and that's actually more realistic. So this whole question doesn't make sense. Don't, don't worry about it. Rabbits and fox model. You know this Bass Innovation model, you know this. Aha. Uh -huh. And I also got a question about these things, uh, the, the stable points, especially in the last quiz. So let's, let's go. Uh, le let me show you what, what happens. So in the last lecture, We have a dynamical system, and basically I'm answering this question and then also the related question in the third quiz. We have the following system, okay? Maybe we have a control parameter, I don't know. We, we don't need the control parameter for this reasoning, but maybe we have a control parameter. So if we plot x, the solution, and x is a function of t, okay? If we plot the solution versus its first derivative, versus the rate of change, then what we need to plot here is simply the function f. Okay? This is the function f. This is what relates x and x prime. So, l well, let's have a look now. If this is the function f, these are fixed points because the first derivative is zero, is zero. And then we start reasoning in the following way. It's always the same way, by the way. What happens if we disrupt this equilibrium? We disrupt it a little bit. Let's say we go here. We disrupt it and we come to that point. What will be the next value of x? Not x dot, but x. Well, let's have a look. We increase x a little bit, right? We increase it and we come here. We increase it a little bit and we come here. What is the value of, of x prime? It's positive, right? This is zero. Which means that our x, according to that equation, should continue to increase, right? Therefore, if we just disrupt the equilibrium a little bit, we go up. According to our equation, positive rate of change, we should keep increasing. All right? The same thing happens here. We disrupt the x a little bit here, for instance. So we decrease it by a little bit. Rate of change is negative, so it should keep decreasing. Therefore, we move away from the stable point. In the same way, this now would be a stable point. Is it clear why? If we disrupt x a little bit, so we Im increase it. Rate of change is negative, which means that it should decrease in the next time period. So we increase it by a shock. The dynamic says, no, go back, decrease it. So we go back to that point. The same reasoning here, the same reasoning here, unstable point. And this was the, what was introduced in the third lecture. The slope of that thing is negative. The slope of fx is negative. Now, that question. We looked into this picture from a slightly different angle, but it's the same reasoning. We disrupted a little bit, and, and 
and we'll see what happens. And that's different angle was the following. We still have that system. I'll just use a different color. We still have this system, but now we say uh, we looked into the gradient systems. And gradient systems are simply, <laughs> yeah, it's a different way to look into things. We said, let's assume now that our particle or our, our object of interest um, follows a gradient field. Now, what would that mean exactly? Uh, what was this? Uh, yeah, let's say it's something like this. All right. Oh, that's so ugly. This is zero here. We simply rewrote the system like this. Now our function f is minus the derivative of another function v. Why do we do all this kind of mental gymnastics? Well, if you look into things in this way, then you can think of v as a potential which is somehow very relevant for physics because you have particles moving in some potentials. So positive, negative potential. So if you look into this, and we have a ball, let's put a particle here, a ball here. According to that equation, the rate of change of that ball should be the negative of the slope, which means that it should follow the direction of steepest decrease, right? The direction of steepest decrease of that thing is here. So it... it it reflects physical reality. If you put a ball in, in this kind of shape, due to gravity, it will go down. It will not go up. If we don't have this minus, if we don't have this minus, forget about the minus. And we're here. If we disrupt this equilibrium a little, well, it's not really an equilibrium. Yeah, it's an equilibrium. If we disrupt this equilibrium a little bit, let's say here, um, <coughs> well, so, no, forget about this. Just, just keep in mind that. Um, we follow the, the direction of steepest decrease because this reflects physical reality. The ball has to go down due to gravity. So it goes down, therefore, this is a stable point. And now some people thought, well, stable points are minimum, uh, all the minimum. If it's a minimum, then it's a stable point. But that's not true. D look at our dynamics. There is a minus there. And as a counterexample, as a counterexample, look at the following system. Look at into the following system. This is f of x. There is no control parameters. We don't need control parameters. This is f of x. Now, this is equal to the derivative of, uh, what is it? Uh, This is our V. Yeah, yeah, okay. Don't care about the constant. This is our V. All right. Let's plot it. Yeah. Here I define it as a V. We can also say that this is equal to minus minus uh, 
Okay? Is that right? This is minus V of X. So let's plot things. V of X, V of X looks something like that. Uh, hmm, hmm, let me see. This is V of X. V minus V of X is simply, well, let's see if I can mirror it exactly. This is minus V of X, and this is V of X. All right. So depending on how you've defined your system, you either have your ball going down like that. Uh, sorry. You either have your ball um, following D of X or following minus the other one. So let's see what happens if we just follow this. Now, what is on the axis? That's, that's also important. This is V of X, obviously, and this is X. All right. Um, so, as you all know, this would be a fixed point because the derivative of X of, of, um, of V of X here is zero. The derivative of V of X is F of X, so when F of X is zero, this is zero. So a function doesn't change. This is a fixed point. Let's disrupt it a little bit. We increase it by a little bit. We increase x a little bit. What happens? The derivative is negative here. So we should go back. So that's a stable point. Um, oh, no. Is that true? Oh, wait a second. No, no, no. The stable points are at plus minus square root of 5. So that should be minus square root of 5. That should be plus square root of 5. Okay? Uh, da -da 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 -da. Yes, so let me increase it a little bit. What? No, no. This is a point. Oh, wait, wait, wait. No, no. This is a point when V of X is zero. Okay? When this is zero. And that is 0 for x equal to 0 here. And it's 0 for what is the other solution? I don't know. Yeah, um, you, you have to x squared minus 5. I think it's square root of 15 or something. Yeah. So this is square root of 15. But that's irrelevant. We, we don't care about this point. We only care about the point where the slope of that thing is zero. The slope of that point is zero here. So we disrupt it a little bit. We increase the x a little bit. OK, yeah. So we increase the x a little bit. We're here now. What is the next x? What should the next x be? The next x is given by the slope of v. The slope of v here is positive. This is a positive slope. So the next x should increase. There it goes. It increases. The same way here it decreases. So you see now a minimum in a potential is unstable point, simply because of the way we defined our dynamics. Now let's look, and two th the two things are equivalent. Let's look at x following that thing over there, minus the blue line. 
we increase the x a little bit. What is the next x? The next next x? It should be the opposite of the slope. The slope here is negative. This is a negative slope. The opposite of the negative slope is positive. So the point should increase. So x should increase. Again, unstable point. Yeah, we put a minus in front of it to make things look like reality, in as in the sense that in the sense that if we put a ball here, it goes down. That's that's why. But the reasoning why a point is stable or not is exactly the same. You perturb it a little bit and you see what the next one should be. Should it be? Should it increase? Should it go back? And you simply look at x dot. What is x dot? It tells you exactly what happens. Okay, I spend way too much time on this. But I think it was worth it. So let's quickly go through that. Rabbit fox, da da da. Okay, you all know this. And finally, the third online quiz. The third online quiz was pretty easy. So do you think we need to go? Oh, let's go through it. Wow. I c is oh. This is very annoying. So don't don't go now doing the quiz. All right. How is the Goodwin's model different endogenous? It's the first endogenous model that we saw. Why did Caldor introduce nonlinear functions? Because otherwise we don't get oscillations. Investment accelerator, aha. Uh -huh. So look at this. What is the investment accelerator? It is the fraction uh, of consumption difference, the difference in consumption, that is, uh, that is covered by new investment. So we need to have new investments. This answer, the fraction of consumption uh, covered with existing, is it? Yeah, with the existing capacity, is what this theory of acceler accelerator multiplier uh, assumes away. Yeah, right? Remember, according to the to the to this theory, we never have unused capacity. We always have full capacity. Exactly to avoid situations like these, where we have increase in consumption, but due to unused capacity, we don't, um, we do not induce new investments so we want to we want to remove this possibility and that's why we assume full capacity what does the market clearing mechanism do that's fine we just set the prices Hicks model of business cycles yes we have the two boundaries upper and lower bound when suppliers switch market with infinite sensitivity that means that they react to the smallest profit differentials. This I talked about now. I also think that's that's clear. Um, this is also clear. Okay, this question may be a little bit confusing. What is meant here is the um <coughs> investment rate. Right? Remember in the solo model, uh, in, in the, the standard economic models in, in general, savings equal investment. So what we save is not kind of does not accumulate interest in, in in the bank. It's immediately reinvested back back. So savings equal investments. And you know, in the solo model, when the savings rate S equals alpha, S equals alpha, 
you maximize consumption. And that's the question here. Instead of savings rate, I should have said investment rate because the two things are equal. Investment equals savings. Um, <coughs> I just said investment and I meant investment rate. Um, some people are confused, but fortunately it was not critical for them to pass the quiz. So um, this is this is why the answer here is the consumption is maximized. This is basically the consumption with S when S equals alpha. All right. Now we can start with the questions. Anybody else? No, go. Um, wait, wait, wait. Okay, so tell me which slide. I will show the, the, the slide here. Oh, come on. 27, you say. Yes. This one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's wrong. Oh, yes. So uh, the question is, um, if you look at this bullet point, it basically tel tells you that steady state consumption is not possible for the golden level of capital which is basically wrong. It's, it's a completely wrong bullet point. Because, <laughs> I mean, what is the golden level of capital? The golden level of capital is nothing else but the equilibrium point which maximizes your consumption. It's one of the many stationary states that you can have in the solo model, but it, it's still a stationary state which maximizes your consumption. In that sense, uh, it cannot be true that steady state consumption is not possible. It is possible because K gold is still an equilibrium point. If you remember uh, how the equilibrium point is determined, it's the intersection between investment and depreciation. So that point is K star or K stationary. And if we choose investment, if we choose uh, savings to be equal to alpha, then the K that you get from the intersection is the golden K, but it's still a stationary state. So it's wrong. Thank you. So scratch it. Other questions? Uh, no, you had a question. Lecture 7. Uh, lectures. So the questions, okay, wait a second. Mm -hmm. Is this lecture seven? Yes, so you want to go to the questions at the end. Hold on. This should be the last slide if it renders. Okay. So, so the question is, um, in each of these different models, common source model, uh, bus innovation model, mixed source model, what are the mechanisms which generate an S-curve? Uh, like this. So the answer is, let, let's, let's go to the common source model. How to explain the S curve da, da, da. here. We started first with now where is the common source model? Mm. 
Oh my god. Okay, good. So in the common source model, the mechanism, well, first of all, we don't have an S-curve in the common source model. That's one. So if, if you, so the so the answer for the common source model is we don't have an S curve, but if we go to the bus innovate the mixed source model, well it's clear the mechanisms are the um, uh, what was it Al was it alpha uh, so it's the al yes it's the alpha from here. So the mechanisms are the interplay between broadcasted public information and interaction, or this word of mouth effect here, beta. So this is the mechanism which generates an S-curve. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But if you don't want to remember equations, you just remember broadcasted public information and word of mouth effect. Uh, no, no. Wait a second. Where is the best innovation model? Okay, the density. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's go to the best to the best first. Where is the bus innovation? Did I miss it? Nineteen, no. Oh yes, 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 yes. Um, I understand, I understand. The question is not, yes, the question is not technically 100% defined properly because a more proper definition would be would have been what are the minimum mechanisms required to explain the s curve in all these models and then we wouldn't need the common source uh, the the broadcasted public information but the way it's asked such an answer would be perfectly accepted would be would be accepted yes if you say the Minimal, the minimally required mechanisms are these, that's also fine. But the question was kind of simpler than that. It just asked you to go through the slide and see, aha, uh -huh, here we have broadcasted, here we have word of mouth, here we only have word of mouth to reiterate these things. But if, if you explain it in, in that way, then it's also perfectly fine. And in the density dependent model, it's uh, where was this, these animals? Uh, code start problem. Uh, it's the carrying capacity in the animals, or the density dependent model. Other questions? Uh, yes. No, no, no. I mean, I know you have a lot of questions, but let's let's give the chance to somebody else. The style of the question would be a bit more precise, I would say. Uh, for instance, it will ask you to describe, if it, you would be presented, that's an example, I'm not saying it will happen. Uh, you would be presented with a graph that we've seen on the slides, it would be just copy paste from the slides, and then you have to explain this graph. So what you see, how, it, how it was generated, um, and, and things like this. It's hard for me to say whether it's theoretical. It will be easy. <laughs> no, the thing is, it, it, it will not even ask you detailed equations. You may be presented with an equation and asked to explain the parameters, uh, but definitely won't, you won't be presented with, with, let's say, the Higgs 
uh, equation for the business cycles and then ask you to explain some mathematical properties of this system. Don't have to no, no, you don't have to derive anything. Okay. Uh, lecture 7 or tw uh, 12? Hold on. Uh -huh. 26. 26. Yes. So th the question is whether there is something called multiple accelerated theory. Uh, there is. So in the way that these concepts were introduced, first the multiplier, then the accelerator, um, yes, they are just fractions, alpha, beta, but people refer to them as the multiplier theory because it relies on all these assumptions. Okay, so when you talk about the multiplier theory, you don't just talk about alpha, you, ju you also talk about all these assumptions. So they go hand in hand, I I in a sense. But for example, in the good news model, the second consumption is a multiplier. We don't have the no, the Goodwin model doesn't have the multiplier and accelerator. Mm -hmm. uh, the Samuelson and the Hicks model, they're basically kind of mathematical formulations of the Keynes ideas. But the Goodwin's model is completely different. It, it has no, it, it has no multiplier, no accelerator. This is just a summary of the no of the assumptions that underlie multiplier and accelerator. Both, Both models, yes. I mean, they all rely on multiplier and accelerator. The difference is is basically the invest the the two bounds. That's the difference. Yes. <coughs> there will be no multiple choice questions. All of them will be open questions. I mean, I don't know what you mean by open questions. Yes, all of them would be open questions, yes. And the exam is closed book. It's closed book. You don't even need a dictionary. If you could understand me, then you don't need a dictionary. Because lots of people ask, "Do can I bring a dictionary? Well, why would you use a dictionary for? It's not an English class. You can also, you can no, no, you can also provide some answers in German if if that would be easier for you. That's also fine. Hmm? If you don't the then you can ask me. Oh. I will be there. It won't be unsupervised exam. Yes. Uh, you always try to reach an end in the two models, right? I always, uh, can you repeat? Uh, you always try to get an endogenous model. Endogenous model. Yes. That's, a, that's a very good question. So why do we care more about endogenous, um, uh, or let's say why do we like more endogenous models or endogenous explanations from f for phenomena than exogenous? It's a good question. What anybody has any opinions on that? No one has any opinions. Yes. So Yes, y you're going into into the right direction. So the thing is that yes. Yes, you both have the right intuition. And, and basically the answer is exogenous explanations rely on your ability to, to explain how this exogenous factor arised in the first place. 
right? Let's, let's take a model. Let's take Samuelson model. What are the exogenous factors there? Alpha and beta, right? This multiplier and accelerator. They come from the outside. If somebody sets the values of these parameters to something, then we get cycles. So if you, that, that's nice, but it doesn't answer the question, who sets alpha and beta? Where do they come from? They come from the outside. You know, it's, it's this outside that we didn't explain. Endogenous means that everything happens within the system, so we can explain all the parameters um, within the system. So it's, 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 it gives you more, I wouldn't say predictive power, I would say it gives you more explanatory power. And ultimately I would say more controlling power because you can propose better policies. Other questions? Yes. Oh, definitely. You, you have the feeling that in the quizzes, how many questions required this? Yeah, just not, not really understanding the topic, but just knowing one or two words that I want to grab and just work on the topic. My goal was for the quizzes to, to make you know everything by heart. Because the idea, I mentioned this in the beginning, the idea of the quizzes was simply to force you to open the slides again. Not to remember them, but just to open them and find the information. No, no, no. Understanding is completely up to you. The goal of the quizzes was simply to force you to open the slides and hopefully you remembered something, even if you didn't try. Now, for the exam though, it's a completely different thing. For the exam, you won't be required to re memorize anything you would be asked to understand it. So if you try to understand also the answers to the quizzes, then you're fine. Yes? Okay, so uh, I will answer this question. But first I would like to answer all the questions that are related to the slides. Anything unclear? Some plot maybe, draft, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Uh, so you see, the this I, I believe this is the Goodwin's model, yes. The Goodwin's model relied on um, the capitalist propensity to save is constant. Uh, where was it? Uh, where was the introduction? Yes, capitalist propensity to save is one. So everything they got, it's saved and then it's reinvested. E economically feasible perturbations mean that you change this assumption a little bit by economic arguments, so you can claim it shouldn't be constant, let's make it decreasing function of the wage. So the more they have to pay for, for employees, the less they save. So in, in essence, it's a, small, it's a small change in your model from an economic point of view. You just, so this is not a constant anymore, it's a decreasing function of the wage. And then it leads to completely different dynamics. So the model is in a sense not stable to to changes in the assumptions. You know, it's kind of stress test, if you'd like, for, for those with quantitative <laughs> background. Exactly. The model's results are too dependent on the assumptions. So if we perturb the assumptions a little bit, it all changes. That's, that's one criticism. Other questions related to the slides? Anything unclear? Yes, I just remembered something before uh, you asked the question. The slide where increasing and decreasing returns to scale are defined. The signs there are mixed up. 
Actually, I can go there. You can write it down. Oh, we have a lot of time left. Uh, do you remember? W okay, this is this is the one. This is the slide. Um, hold on, hold on. Here. These signs are reversed. So this should be less, this should be greater. This is this is lecture. Uh, which lecture was this? Hold on. Lecture ten, slide eight. Right? No, sorry, slide seven. Lecture ten, slide seven. Yes. No. You had a question. Slide five, lecture twelve. Yes. There's a lot of points. Everything is increasing. How we, what, what are the limits? How it can it generate an oscillatory behavior? It generates an it generates an oscillatory behavior only when alpha is equal to one over beta. So for this very particular, um, very particular parameter combination, you can see this from this plot. Only when alpha equals to one over beta equals one over beta, this happens, right? When we increase beta, alpha decreases. When did we ever talk about that? Lecture eight. Which slide? Aha. Uh -huh. You mean so your question is how do we get from this? How do we get to this? Well, okay. So, okay, that's that's a that's a deeper question. Um, continuous time model means that you can discretize your time scale infinitely. So, if you look at, I always refer to the following thing. We have our stable point here, x. Then we perturb it a little bit. What is the new value of x at the next time step? But in a continuous sense, the next time step could be infinitely close to your current time step. So you can discretize your interval infinitely, in infinitely many times. And the, the thing is that the smaller the time steps, the more accurate you are. When you discretize things, look how we discretize. We simply did the Taylor expansion around 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 t t plus delta t right delta t is your time step and the taylor expansion we approximated it by just by the first term we ignored all these things so when you do the taylor expansion and you take the time step to be 1 this is the discrete this is how you compute it actually in in your computer this is the discrete dynamics and now depending on your function depending on what this is going from continuous time to discrete time could completely change everything. One example is the exponential function. If you try to approximate x prime equal to e to the power of x by this Taylor method, this linear approxim uh, approximation, with a time step of 1, it's a huge time step, you would get a completely different, a completely wrong result. So the difference between these two models is, is, is perspective, if you want to be philosophical. Other questions?
Uh, I think it was first. Oh, okay. Other questions about the course, uh, about the slides, and I will answer this. Lecture number 12, slide 14. Yes. This one? It's about? Ah, the lower bound. Uh, but then which lecture is it? Well, isn't this 12? Oh, what? Okay, the lower bound. Where the where was the lower bound? Hold on. Yes, this one. So, the question is, what are the upper bounds and lower bounds again? The I will be short. The upper bound to in uh, the upper bound to output or to investment as well is the fact that as your capital stock increases, you have more and more factories, you have more and more output, it becomes increasingly more expensive to, to invest into new capital goods. For instance, if you have, let's say, a small catering firm, all right, with 10 employees, and you enjoy popularity, and suddenly you're employed by ETH for a huge conference, potentially getting a lot of money, it may not be beneficial for you to hire extra people to, in order to satisfy this, this demand. So you will not be so, it will not be so cheap for you to invest into, let's say, 10 more people or 20 more people. Another example is if you already have, let's say, 10 factories, it will be more expensive to invest into, into new factories, let's say, you know, you just get like 10 additional units that you need to produce, but these 10 additional units would require you to build a whole factory. You know, it's not economically sound. So that's the upper bound to investment. You cannot invest indefinitely. Also, you're limited, obviously, by resources. You cannot hire people indefinitely. The lower bound to investment is the notion that when output declines, investors refrain in real life on the aggregate, they refrain from disinvesting, meaning actively selling their assets away. They just don't cover their depreciation costs, but they would not sell their factories because that would be active destruction of capital and Hicks thought, reasoned that this doesn't happen on the aggregate. And therefore, there is a lower bound on disinvestment. And that lower bound is simply equal to the depreciation cost. You cannot disinvest more than your depreciation cost on the aggregate. Other questions? Yes. Lecture 11, slide 27. This one. The question, wh what is the question? These things. Ah, well. Okay. I will answer this question if you want after the lecture. But, I mean, I have to write things down for you now to show you. And I, d I don't know if, if that's something that most people would like. Yes. Yeah, you can send me emails, but I, I cannot promise to answer all of them, depending on how many I get. And I, I mean, if you ask me, can you repeat lecture 11? You know. You can ask me short questions, no problem.
Lecture 12, slide 1. That's like the introductory slide. Slide 1, uh, just beyond the slide 5. Okay, slide 5. <laughs> this one? Uh, no. Oh, that's not lecture 12. What is it? Oh, come on. Oh, that's lecture 11, sorry. Slide 5. This one? What is the question? It's written here and I explain it in the podcast. So just, just listen to the podcast. I don't want to repeat myself. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh huh. So you mean why we have this? I oh, why why we have this model? Uh, why we have this cycle? Yes, yes. Uh, wait a second. Um, <coughs> so this is the employment rate and this is the share of capital that goes to output, yes. Come to me after the, the lecture, I mean. Okay. So thanks. Well, wait, I, I had a thank you speech, but fine, we're going to, we're going to. We're going to skip it because we have no time. So, um, yeah, but no, we're not going to skip it. It's a good speech. So I, I want to thank all of you for, you know, being so committed to this course. I got so many emails spotting mistakes in the slides, asking me, basically really identifying mistakes in the slides. Um, and kind of trying to improve how the course is being taught by feedback and everything. Uh, you not only put up with these kind of typos and, and, and confusions that arise in the slides, but you also kind of, you know, try to spot them actively, which I think improves understanding. It also contributes to frustration, but uh, it's a good thing to, to know how to deal with frustration. The point is, um, most of you were quite dedicated to, to trying to follow this course. And I hope you got something out of it. Uh, no matter if you remember the math, that's not important. I hope you remember the main messages. I wish you good luck to your exams, for your exams. I wish you good luck for your studies. Uh, but above all, I wish you good luck for after the studies. Because that's when things become interesting. Um, happy holidays. And I'm pretty sure I'll see most of you around in the university. So, thank you. <laughs> As I said, I will, I will communicate the exact room for the exam by email. In the meantime, you can still send me emails. <laughs>